You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. Chasers of light to the purveyors of pictures. To all of you listening from around the world, this is the F11 Photography Podcast. I am your host, Kevin Deal, along with your other host, Mr. Brandon Gorey. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the F11 Photography Podcast. It is so great to be back. We've got a great episode coming up ahead. Kevin's been watching some baseball in the interim, but we got a lot to talk about today. Yeah, I'm not a baseball fan, uh, really. So, uh, I mean, I am a baseball fan, but I, I did I cheated this year. So I'm a Texas Rangers fan, and I watched zero games the entire regular season. And then, uh, because I didn't want to pay for Bally's, which is their, uh, you know, cable thing that you got to pay for. It's like, nah, I'm not going to do it. They have local blackouts. There's a bunch of bullshit rules that go with baseball, but um, they made the playoffs. And so the, all the games are on Fox. So I am a bandwagon fan this year. I watched zero seconds of Texas Rangers baseball and I've watched all their playoff games so far in there. Hey, you know what? They're, they are two and O and they're up two O in this game. So they haven't lost a baseball game since I started watching them this year. So if you're a Texas Rangers fan listening, you're welcome. So anyway, yeah, that's, that's that's great. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Because, because me watching it is clearly the reason why they're, they're doing so well. I mean, obviously the sports, sports superstitions are weird like that. So what have you been up to? Well, recently I've just been up to, uh, I've been gearing up for New York. Um, it's been a, it's been a long time coming, but I've got a week vacation and I will be shooting a lot of models in New York. So I've been spending a lot of my free time, um, not only looking at Google Maps, but looking at different places to shoot in New York. I've been looking at different brutalist architectural buildings. I've been looking at abandoned buildings that you can access from public roadways. Go on. Have you seen that one building? Uh, it's an AT and T building Straight that has building. Yeah, there, yep. there's only there's like two or three windows on the entire skyscraper. Yeah, that's where I would go. First. So. If I, if I were into brutalism. That's okay. So no, that's a great point. Um, a lot of the brutalist structures, I will be shooting at the Tracy Towers, which is a Bronx project building. And here's like, the thing is uh, that I learned very quickly in looking at all these brutalist structures is I don't want every single one of my model shoots to be just me shooting straight up <laughs> from, from the ground to get uh, the brutalism in the structure. But there's actually this really one interesting brutalist structure, and it is the George Washington uh, bus station uh, right by the George Washington Bridge. So that's something where I won't have to worry too much about shooting upwards, and it's uh, definitely accessible to the public. Just don't take the Dumbo shot uh, that Peter Lindbergh made famous with Cindy Crawford and Naomi Kim. It's already been done. It's nope. been done so many times. Well, that's the thing is like when you look up photography spots in New York, you don't get cool spots because that's, you know, people in the know get those shots. No, you get the spots where people take engagement photos. So I've been having to do a lot of, um, a lot of finessing to find cool spots, looking up places on Google maps and stuff like that. Like I've been looking at a lot of, uh, editorial magazine stuff and just going like, okay, where did they shoot that in New York? Like there's a specific street, uh, in Chinatown that looks really good at a certain type of day. They'll probably look at with a certain film stock. You know, there's different studios. Don't forget to uh, do night photography while you're there. Oh, because yeah. with, with one of your models, and here's why, because there's not a city in the U.S., in my opinion, that will pull off the Blade Runner look like New York City because you have the steam coming up from the subway. subway. Uh, you've got the lights, and you can find neon, so, you know, maybe, maybe in Chinatown, That's an uh, excellent you got point. the neon, you got the steam coming off the subway that you're not going to get. Cause I, I did a, I did a kind of a Blade Runner theme shoot in Dallas a couple weeks ago and I had everything but the steam because it was a hundred and fucking eight degrees outside, but you're going to get that in the fall in New York. So that is such an excellent point. Actually, uh, one of the last times I was in New York, uh, I met a very special person there, but that's besides the point 
is I brought Cine Still and shot on my Yashica Mat 124G. And that was my first experience with uh, long exposure night photography with Cine Still. And oh my gosh, some of my favorite shots I've ever taken on Cine Still. But you'll be happy to hear this, Kevin, is I've budgeted my first day there for location scouting. And we just talked about an episode about risk management. So for my first day, I have a list of about nine locations that I need to see in person. A day of street photography. Oh. Yeah, that's fucking awesome. It's location scouting, baby. I'll tell you what, there's this one place. I forget what it's called. It's like the Red Grain Silo on Brooklyn. And it is a, it's a 29 foot structure that used to be a grain processing plant. And it's like, you can walk up the spiral staircase that goes all the way up. And like, I've seen videos of people doing it, like skaters and people who are just trespassing to get cool shots. It is terrifying. There are stairs missing all the way up and it's iron. It's all rusted. And it's like, you have to step on the missing stair, like pieces, like that are kind of jutting out to get up. And it's like, there's so many places in the silo where it's just like, you slip, you fall to your death. Well, uh, don't do that. <laughs> don't go there. But it like the, the view is so cool because you, you overlook the bay with the, obviously the skyline in the background and it's all industrial and it's 29 stories high, but it is so, so dangerous. Yeah, so don't, so I guess the the moral of the story there is don't do that. I wish, you know, I wish I was able to afford a trip to New York right now, but I've had such an expensive week uh, with deductibles, uh, with uh, the hail damage to my house, and uh, my my brand new car needs a fucking new hood. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna throw a shout out because you brought up a good point. It is expensive to go to New York. How is Brandon affording this trip to New York? Well, he sells cocaine. Uh, besides, besides selling cocaine, um, I recently got a chase, uh, Sapphire card. And when, when it's your first time signing up for this card, you have three months to spend $4,000. So clearly I just, for three months, I put my rent on the card and I put my groceries on the card and pay it off immediately. And I got a thousand dollars back in points. And I, it was a fucking, it was a $500 round trip flight to New York. And then the, the other $500 paid for my Airbnb. So I'm just covering food and studio costs. Airbnb is going through a big problem right now. What is Airbnb cost in New York City right now? Oh my God. Okay. Well, I'll, on my West, West side Manhattan, I have a really, really wonderful guest. I'm paying 63 bucks a night for West Manhattan, but you can expect at the moment anywhere it's like 170 a night plus. And, and the funny thing enough, it's to Kevin's point. I know you're going to go into this two months ago. You could find a place in Brooklyn for 45 at night that, that that stopped two months ago. The bubble burst, it sounds like, because last time I looked into going to Manhattan, it was like 400 bucks a night to stay in places. It's it's absolutely... What, what New York just did to Airbnb is absolutely atrocious. Yeah, I'll bet. Well, I have had uh, less exciting planning going on. Like I said, I'm dealing with car stuff. Uh, interesting, I, I've had my... So I've had my electric car for a month, and... You know, I didn't buy it as a political statement, as I talked about. I just bought it because, you know, I I didn't want to pay for gas, right? And so uh, I got uh, electrical stuff installed, a new electricity installed in my house to where I can plug my car into my house. And it costs, you know, five and a half, six dollars to quote unquote fill up my car and get me 300 miles out of it, which is great. But something that's been kind of odd is I've been driving around and I've just, I've noticed people who, which by the way, People like it's, it's, you know, it's a first amendment thing in the U S everybody wears their sleeve on their, in their bumpers on their car. Like they put bumper stickers on their car to define who they are. Uh, it's like, they could be a a pro political movement. They could be a bootlicker with one of those thin blue line, uh, stickers, which, which really, I mean, let's be honest. The reason you put it on your car isn't because you support law enforcement. It's because you're trying to get out of a fucking ticket when you get pulled over. I'm on to you. Um, but People put stuff on their cars to, you know, like, this is what I'm about. And, you know, I have a, I have a couple, I have a Austin FC cause I support our local soccer team. And then I have a, one of those chive Bill Murray stickers on my uh, SUV because, uh, which by the way, if you don't know the backstory on that, Bill Murray, but if you see somebody with a Bill Murray sticker on there, Bill Murray, uh, liked the charities that they were donating to. And so he said, you know what, if you sell pictures of my likeness as stickers and all that money goes to charity, I'm cool with it. So that's what that means. If you're not sure what a Bill Murray sticker is on someone's car, but anyway, that's, that's, that's the extent in which I I do that. But there are people out there who are so anti 
electric and hybrid vehicles that they put stuff like fuck your EV on their car. And it's like, and, and it's always, it's not a car. It's always a truck where they rip the muffler off and it's raised. And it's just like, what a fucking loser. Like how big of a fucking loser do you have to be to where it's like, what are you about? I'm about saying fuck people who drive vehicles that plug into their house. Like you're a fucking loser. And no, and, 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 by the way, People who own Teslas, there's a weird cult of Tesla people out there who go out and buy vanity plates that say zero emissions. You're fucking losers too. And I, I'm, I'm not. I'm applying uh, losership here equally. So I'm not. I'm not just picking on people who who drive cars that get two miles per gallon. But like, seriously, who are these fucking people who like they drive these race trucks and they just like, you know, it's like I like spending you know four hundred dollars a month in gas to tell people who drive hybrids to fuck off, like. What's up with those people? I, I think a lot of people are just having conversations that we're not having. You know, it's like uh, it's like Lamborghini versus Ferrari. You know, you see their license plate like, you know, fuck Enzo or like, you know, Enzo's last or something like that. Or like, you know, people it's it's a conversation that we're not having. You know, you've got the American made versus the Japanese made conversation. You've got the diesel versus the EV and you've got the Tesla versus the Nissan Leaf. Like these are just the rivalry. You know, well, we know a lot of rivalries like that is like the Nikon versus Canon. We don't. And I hate those people too. Yeah, we don't play into those conversations. You know, I might, I might, you know, be a Reddit warrior and Kevin doesn't know about it. I might be shitting on people who shoot Canon behind Kevin's back, but I don't bring that uh, to the public eye. By the way, Jared <laughs> Poland shits on people who shoot on a Z6. I heard, I was, I was listening to Raw Talk the other day and he's like, he was like, so he's basically like, yeah, basically uh, you can take pictures on every good camera nowadays except a Z6. And I, I just almost Dude. ran off the road thinking of you. <laughs> Dude, no, how true is that? Like using the Z6, it wasn't until I got the Z8 that I realized like, oh, like I was just really well good at it, adapting to shitty autofocus. Yeah, well, it you're like, oh, I've won a, you're like, I've, I don't want to brag, but I've won awards with this camera. And I was like, well, bro, your camera fucking sucks. It your does. new camera is so much better. Like, like when we did the camera swap episode, like the reason why Brandon hates my GFX is because I fucking handicapped him with a fucking vintage lens. If I give him my GFX and I like put it in a normal shooting mode, which I'm going to do one day, he'll, he'll, once he starts taking pictures, they'd be like, oh, okay, I get it. I'll believe but, it when I see it. Yeah. yeah, he'll believe. Well, he, you've seen pictures I've taken with that thing. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to throw it out there. But anyway, well, we are uh, <laughs> we're we're 13 minutes in almost, and we still haven't even started to. Kev, uh, Kevin's audio level, the the way it raised after shooting on the Z6, tells you everything you knew, need to know about Kevin and I's relationship about shooting different cameras. <laughs> well, I just didn't like the Z6, so the way it focused, I thought it produced good pictures when it hit. It just, I mean. You have a mirrorless uh, full frame camera that has a hit rate that's as good as my medium format with fucking vintage lenses on it. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was atrocious. Yeah. Anyway, today's sponsor is The Hanser. Is the cost of film kicking you in the nuts? Well, <laughs> get The Hanser. Uh, if you're not familiar with what Dehancer is, Dehancer is a film emulation software, and it is a great film emulation software. Brian and I, we are very stuck up about our film stuff, our film looks. And whenever I, and I'm a Fuji shooter, by the way. And so like, I hear these people obsess over film simulation recipes and all that. And I'm always like, dude, just go shoot film. Like, like if you want to get somewhere in the ballpark, that's great. But if you really want to get the film look, go shoot film because digital can't do it. Well, I will say that the answer is pretty fucking close. And yes, I just dropped an F-bomb on a live spot for a, an ad. But it's because it actually does things that uh, film simulations don't do. So film simulations, they'll get the colors right, but they won't, they won't do those anomalies that occur, the physical anomalies that occur of taking light and putting it through a film emotion, emulsion. The organic game, grain structure on it is, is awesome. The fact that you can do halation, the fact that you can do bloom, the fact that you can emulate a print, which is also part of this whole process of shooting on film. Uh, it does all of that. And we have a link in the description of this pod that you can check out, or you can use the code Gory10 for Brandon Gory. I'm going to burp. That's my last name. Yeah, it's his last name. Gory, Gory. Scottish. Uh, anyway, so use the use the link uh, in the description of this pod or uh, type in the code Gory10. So we're 15 minutes into the pod, and we haven't even announced what the fuck we're going to talk about in today's pod. We're going to talk about tech 
that has changed our lives. Okay. And so, you know, they say, oh, it's the, it's the carpenter, not the tools. But every now and then tools come along where you're just like, wow, that really simplified my life. And, uh, you know, there's, there's just a lot of that out there, a lot of tech. And, you know, like, so for instance, I'll start off with eye tracking, uh, you know, Canon mirrorless, like Canon got so much shit for getting into the mirrorless game late. And when they finally did get into the mirrorless game and they came out with the R5 and the R6, all of a sudden, you know, so for instance, I'm a Fuji shooter and I've been shooting Fuji for years and Fuji has been on the mirrorless side of things for years and they use less demanding sensors. Uh, I'm talking about the X mount. They're using APS-C sensors, right? Well, for the longest time, Fuji's autofocus and, and it's still not quite there yet. They've, they've been out for 10 years now and their autofocus has always been kind of meh. Canon comes right in with the R5 and R6 and is like, fuck you. We're right up there with Sony right away. Eye tracking, like something, some tech that changed my life, holding down back button focus, have it track the eye. And I don't have to focus on whether or not it's going to be in focus. I can just focus on composing my shots and nailing it. And I can actually like take my mental bandwidth and reallocate it to other things like, Hey, maybe I should pay attention to if a hair's out of place or if the makeup is having some issues or whatever. That's tech that has fundamentally changed the way I approach my photography. And so in this episode, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. So coming up next, Brandon is going to talk about some tech that's changed his life. This is Jason Berkman, and you're listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. All right, we're back, and we're going to start off with some tech that has changed Brandon's life. Brandon, take it away. Okay, so this is really interesting. Is I, I just want to say that um, my my skills and my tech and my investments as a photographer uh, before meeting Kevin and after meeting Kevin uh, have changed a lot. Um, now, Kevin and I we work very closely together, and we often talk about what we use, how we how we approach photography, and what makes our lives easier. And a lot of things that Kevin has shared with me, I have taken on board and and built into my photography pro- process. So this will be very redundant for Kevin, but for me, they have definitely changed uh, my 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 life and made my life easier as a photographer. And the first thing I want to talk about are battery powered strobes. So. First and foremost, if you are going to a studio or you're going to a location and you want available light and you don't want to worry about where that's coming from or anything, a battery-powered strobe is absolutely phenomenal. It gives you a lot of options. It gives you a lot of uh, leeway with your lenses and cameras. If you want to shoot a crop sensor where you're not getting as much light and your camera's ISO sensitivity absolutely blows, you can bring a strobe and you can get away with it and still get amazing crisp photos at the top ability of your camera because you have that available light. If you show up to a studio, like a lot in Austin where they're kind of boutique studios and they say, oh, we only have triggers for Canon cameras and you're shooting a Nikon like myself and they're using pro photo flashes. Um, you can bring a battery powered strobe like the Neewer Vision 4 which is very affordable on Amazon and will last you an entire shoot and a half at near full power. Uh, it's, it's an absolute tank. You can set uh, you can set other strobes to slave mode, put the cap on that strobe and just aim it in the general direction you're shooting and suddenly you don't need a trigger. You've got, you've got a trigger through your strobe and it works really, really well. It has saved my bacon more times than I care to mention. It's funny that you bring that up because... In recent episodes, I have uh, made the announcement that I am a pro photo user now, but I have not left Godox. And I didn't really go into a lot of detail about that, but what Brandon just mentioned is something that I want to talk about. So I have the pro photo B1. I have a D1, which is the one that plugs into the wall. So I have a battery powered and a one that plugs into the wall. And then my small, smaller hybrid, I have a B10. The B10 is a lot smaller than the B1 and the D1. And sometimes I only need one light on a location shoot, but sometimes I want to bring a second light with me. Well, Profoto makes the A2. It's about the size of a Coke can and it's a thousand dollars. And I finally, even though I bought Profoto stuff and I'm I'm just like, man, some of that shit is just too expensive. And I've seen some shootouts between the Profoto B1, I'm sorry, not B1, B10 and the Godox 
AD100. And the AD100 from Godox actually was a little brighter. It just had some color cast issues. So anyway, I fixed those on mine. To Brandon's point about using a radio trigger, uh, I am using a Profoto AD100 as my second light now, along with my, uh, I'm sorry, a Godox AD100 as my second light to my B10. And I'm using two different brands now. And it's saving me, you know, about $700 because it's a $300 light versus a $1,000 light with Profoto. And so, yes, that the, you know, you're know you talking about like uh, battery powered flashes just being super compact now. That's that's one thing that where, where they've made big advancements because only three or four years ago, if you wanted power, you had to have a really heavy light. And they've gotten so much more efficient with the batteries on them. And a Profoto AD100 with, with a, you know, at one meter, three feet with a softbox, you can shoot, uh, you can overpower, the, you can equal the sun with it. So I could have somebody in the shade, I can light them up from a meter away, and it can be 2 p.m. And then that's something that's the size of a Coke can. It's, it's smaller than a lens. Continue. And, and to Kevin's point, is it like, at the end of the day, like we're using available light, like the quality of our light is that's our medium. That is our canvas as so to speak. That's what we're painting with. It's, it's, it's everything. And so making sure that you have available light on demand that is very simple to work with, very compatible with multiple brands and multiple cameras, that's going to save your bacon, um, more often than not. And then one, another thing I want to jump into, which is actually, um, this might be a redundancy for a lot of you. Um, but for me, something that I didn't know was an issue until I started having that issue was a color correct screen. Um, a lot of people when they're starting out as a photographer or even like just going through the process of being a photographer, they're three, four years in, uh, they might be just editing on a PC laptop or something like that where the, the screen is very much not color managed. Now to color manage the screen um, with the actual hardware and, and to get the, the apps and the devices, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It's very expensive. And it's uh, sometimes it just can't even recreate the correct color balance on your screen based on what your controls are allowing. So all, all that to say is that it's very important to have a color correct screen. I remember I was doing a lot of my photography work on a an expensive HP laptop. It was a thousand bucks. It had a great graphics card and everything. And the screen at sRGB was just terrible with color. Uh, I tried everything to color manage it. I tried all the different settings on Photoshop. I went deep diving with forms and everything to, to try and color manage the screen as best as I could. But every time I exported a photo and then looked at it on my phone or someone else's like iPhone or a MacBook or something like that that has a very, very accurate sRGB output, I noticed that my colors were absolutely destroyed. And it was a lot of it was a lot of heartache, it was a lot of headache, and it was a very expensive problem uh, to fix for something that should be so simple, so immediate, and so implied in one's own work. Yeah, I cannot stress enough how much color calibration has transformed my uh, editing and post-production. I harp over and over again about getting everything right out the camera, but there's just things that are out of your control. Color casts, uh, inconsistencies with flash, a shift in the clouds, things that fuck your white balance up and absolutely drive you insane. And, you know, those shifts, if you don't have calibrated monitor, you can't compensate for them correctly. You're going to go look at them and be like, wait, this looks really weird. I use the data color spider X. Uh, that's the one I bought. And by the way, if you do get a color calibration kit, uh, the one place where it can't necessarily get it right. Something you're gonna have to do manually is you typically want to have your brightness of your screen at about two thirds. So you don't want to have your brightness up all the way because if you do that, you'll edit to that and then you'll go take it on your phone and it's like, hey, it seems a little dark. And then you like, you go in and you you, you hit like the auto edit on in, in photos and your 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 uh, your iPhone and all of a sudden it gets a lot brighter. It's because you should have had it at about two thirds and edit it. And when it's bright enough at two thirds, it's going to pop at 100%. So that's just something to keep in mind there too is a little pointer I want to give you. And, and I've been asked before, like, what's the, what's the best solution for this? Because, um, I was recently in the market to purchase a color accurate monitor because I recently upgraded, um, my editing equipment. I just left a MacBook pro and an iMac 2017, um, both of which, uh, the, the graphics card was just not enough to, to handle, 
not only the file size of my recent Z8 upgrade, but also uh, the workflow because I also do uh, videography as well. And so I needed to upgrade uh, my monitors as well. And so I got a new, I got a MacBook Pro M2 and I'm just like, okay, I've got this power. I need a monitor that's going to be color accurate. And I knew in the back of my head, the MacBook Studio or the Mac Studio monitor is always just, it's just right there, 1600 bucks. I'm just like, please, I really don't want to go that route because that is just so much money. And so I spent a good three days, uh, probably a good eight, nine, 10 hours uh, looking at the alternatives, whether that be BenQ, Asus, LG, Dell, or even I, I think it's ISO and, and um, uh, there's one other one. It's like something gate or something like that. Flan, flan gate or whatever. Not sure. But, but basically if you want a, a color, you want color accuracy at a high pixel density, you are paying more than the Apple studio. Um, but I know that's real. It's a treacherous thing to say because this gets expensive so quickly. Basically you've got your 200 to 500 tier monitors, which are going to, they're going to be okay. They're going to be uh, 4k at 27 inches. They're going to be anywhere from 250 to 600 nits in brightness. And they're going to be, um, at least a hundred percent, like 99.5% sRGB color accurate. And then the next thing, uh, next thing after that, uh, is like, I think it's DP three or something like that. Is it P three? It's one of those. And that's the, um, that's the next color space in which they'll probably be anywhere from like 94 to 95% color accurate. But the thing is, is when you're shooting high, higher resolution photos at 45 megapixels, um, you're going to, you're only going to be at like 130 to 168, um, pixels per inch, which is not that great. Um, specifically when you're, when, when the screens are going to be larger, 27 inch, 30, 32 inch. And the color accuracy is going to be different because some of the screens are matte. They, they've got different sort of like coverings. Um, a lot of these screens aren't going to have the, the high contrast because of the matte finishes and stuff like that. And so it's not going to be super color accurate. And they also don't translate well currently with MacBooks and that uh, there's startup issues, there's Thunderbolt connectivity issues, and some things just aren't going to translate very well. And a lot of people do have problems with fragility of these monitors. So all I all I can say is, <laughs> sorry, it's a long tangent. The best solution is instead of instead of buying the immediate really cheap thing, save up for a couple months, save up for half a year, and just get a MacBook because right out the gate they're probably the most color accurate thing. Uh, you can get for the price. Yeah, I ended up buying an iMac with a 5K display in 2021, and I just used that in my data color Spider X, and it seems to get the job done. But the point being, get a good monitor for color calibration, which takes me to one of my next favorite uh, purchases, and that is Capture One. I think the tech in Capture One gives me better. Yeah, it's, there it's you go. So good. So I know I know that the majority of the people listening to this are probably you know Adobe uh, users, and I, I pay for the Adobe. I actually pay for Lightroom every month because it, it, the Creative Cloud thing that's thirty dollars or whatever, like it give you everything. Because I use Premiere for my YouTube channel, I use Photoshop for my my raster based editing, and so I'm already. It, it just makes sense to buy that uh, that that whole creative cloud a monthly thing for 30 bucks, but I also pay $30 a month for capture one. And the reason why, so I just want to tell you about how capture one saved my ass. So I hadn't had, I was using Lightroom for years. Uh, so Lightroom has this weird shit going on where it runs your catalog in the background at all times, you know, every now and then there's like this known thing where you have to like create a new catalog and you know, there's this cash bullshit that's going on with it, whatever it's, it's beyond my pay grade. I'm not a programmer. I don't really know what's going on with it other than the fact that it makes my shit run really slow. Um, what happened was, is when I bought that iMac that I just talked about uh, back in 2021, I, you know, I had, I had flirted with Capture One because everyone that I knew that was super professional said, oh, the color space is better or whatever. And I was like, man, I'm so set in my ways. And I know a lot of you listening are set in your ways and they don't sponsor us in any way, shape or form. I pay $30 a month for this. Okay. So I am absolutely endorsing it with my wallet. And what, what happened was I, I got the new iMac up and running. I, I had everything kind of running and it was, you know, okay. And then all of a sudden, like my external hard drives just disappeared. 
I could not find my external hard drives. And I was like, motherfucker. And so I had, I was about eight projects deep and I, I was eight projects behind and I needed to edit these projects. And so I was like, okay, well I have this trial that I just downloaded. And so I guess I'm going to, this is the time I'm going to learn capture one. And so I sat down and I just buried my head in and I, 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 I transferred the session, one of the sessions to my main hard drive. So I didn't have to worry about my external discs. And I did edits in Lightroom, which I'd been using for years at that point. And I did an edit and capture one, my very first time using it. And I came out on the other side with better looking edits and capture one. It's almost like there's this wool that's been lifted up over my edits. It seems like there's just like this kind of light gray color space thing going on with, with Lightroom. And I was like, okay, well, I learned it and and they had a a, a workspace for migration where you, all the tools will be laid out just like photo, but just like a Lightroom. And I ignored it. I said, "No, I don't I don't want to use the color space that they gave me. I want to use the color space and I'm not the color space, the workspace that they gave me. I want to learn the default workspace that Capture One made because I already know that I like the colors better. I want to know why the 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 workflow might be a little better." And sure enough, I came out on the other side really liking the, the, the default workspace that capture one came up with and my work has improved. Now the re, it's not just at that, that the tech there's the tethering aspect of it. Tether t- when tethering, by the way, which is on Brandon's list of, 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 uh, you know, tech that's changed his life. Capture one was invented as a tethering program. That's what it was there to do originally. And they made it for phase one cameras. Hence the one in capture one is they made it for phase one cameras. So they had to make a color space that could work for $50,000 cameras. And so of course it's going to work on your little $2,000 camera or whatever, but the, the tethering aspect of it is amazing. There's also the aspect of it where, uh, they have these new cool things like capture one live. What's cool about capture one live is that If I am doing a shoot for a brand and the brand is halfway across the world, I can let them tap into my shoot live on a browser and they can see the shots as they spit out and rate them. And and there's all this collaborative stuff that Capture One has that Lightroom doesn't have. Now, Lightroom has the mobile aspect. That's somewhere where Capture One was a little behind, but Capture One is starting to catch up. I am now tethering and the iPad version. So I look like Flavor Flav with a clock. I have an iPad with a shoulder strap on it. And a, and a short USB C and I just, uh, I, I just keep that on my shoulder and I'll just shoot tethered and I'll just like turn the iPad around and they can see it if I'm not shooting uh, tethered to a television. But I just want to talk about capture one and transition into tethering because I know Brandon wants to talk about how, ch- how tethering has changed his life as a photographer. That is absolutely insane. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to clear my throat here. That is insane. People can watch you shoot from the world away live. That is, that is insane. In fact, you know what you can, and they can rate it and color code it in real time from their browser. That's what I, that's what I use. That's what I have agencies. Like when I shoot for an agency, I'll shoot, I'll, I'll call down all my shitty shots and then I'll just send a a link to the agency and I go rate your favorite shots. And as they're rating them, I can actually see, I'll have the session open on one of my windows and I'll be working on something else and I'll see the other session open in the right window. I'll actually see it in real time as they're rating the shots from Dallas or wherever. And I'll go, Dude. cool. And then, I, and, then I, and then I turn around my edits really fast because I know that they're rating them in real time. I'm like, oh, cool. I'll just literally start editing as they're rating them. Dude, that's something where you could set up, like, you know, say you get pretty big, right? You can have a guy working OBS and you can literally do live streams for your shoots where... The audience doesn't have access to the rating features, but they can view the stream live. How amazing could that be? It'd be a live commentary, live shoot. Uh, there's there's so much things coming down the pipeline in, in the ways of content creation. I feel like that uh, that would be huge, especially when you nail down your risk management as a photographer and don't fuck up in front of uh, potentially thousands of people. But excuse my French. I want to talk about tethering and I also want to talk about Capture One. Uh, to Kevin's point, well, first of all, Kevin got me into tethering. Kevin got me into Capture One. Uh, like Kevin, I was using Lightroom. I was making. Send me a check, motherfuckers. <laughs> uh, yeah, for real. Um, like Kevin, I was using Lightroom. I was making presets. I was pretty stoked about the RGB. Uh, sort of color balancing and color grading feature, which is still pretty pretty powerful, but I will say the color science of Capture One paired with the Nikon uh, uh, professional color palette is is just it's just so insane. The details are amazing 
Well, something about Capture One that I want to point out is if you're not hip to Capture One, if you go buy Capture One now, it's called Capture One Pro. But up until about a year ago, they actually made different versions of Capture One. So they made Capture One Nikon. They made Capture One Fuji. They made Capture One Sony. They didn't make Capture One uh, Canon because Canon are pricks and they wouldn't give Capture One the color profiles. But there is no program out there because I shoot Fuji. There's no program out there that better... Uh, uh, captures the Fuji colors. So like if you're shooting on Fuji and you shoot uh, whatever classic Chrome or classic negative or nostalgic negative, those film simulations, they actually have the profiles of the sim simulations built into capture one. And as you switch them, it's just like you're switching them at the camera. It's flawless, but go ahead. Well, I, yeah, again, if you're not using Capture One, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a little bit about my workflow and how it might be amazing for you because this might not have even be something been something you've imagined yet. So, this is how uh, I shoot Capture One. I'm assuming Kevin uh, uses it very similarly. Okay. So, you're at a shoot, you tether your camera, you've got your live shots. All right. When you open Capture One, you go to File, you do New Catalog, and you make sure that catalog saves to an, uh, a hard drive that's connected to your laptop. So right off the bat, you have your camera taking photos that is already saving to a session catalog on Capture One that is not writing to your laptop. It is not writing to your SD card. It is writing to a designated spot in your hard drive already. How insane is that? Wait, are you saying... so? So Capture One uses catalogs and they use sessions. I do sessions, but I, I have a, the only catalogs I have are my old Lightroom catalogs. But since I switched over to Capture One, I just do every session as its own folder and I allocate all my resources to that one session. Is that how you do it? Uh, I haven't been able, I haven't been that precise with my sessions. I've been just doing it on a catalog basis. I think the catalog is a, is a higher uh, level of organization. And so it's a little more concrete for me. So I think technically I am editing in a session in a catalog whenever I set a new catalog, but every catalog does have its own space um, on my hard drive. And those catalogs themselves, they live in my organizational format. So if I go 2023, I've got the model's name. Uh, there that I can click on is the capture one session. And I just double click that and it brings up everything already organized the way that I shot it with my default camera profile already applied to all my photos. And from there, after I'm done with the shoot where I'm not, I'm not having to export anything from my SD card. I'm not having to like that, that, um, that risk of a corrupted card or, or anything like that is suddenly out the window. Everything, all the data is right where I would transfer it to already. And then from there, this is, this is the absolute kicker. This is what absolutely blew my mind out of the water is from there, you have all your photos. You go down and you just make your selections there. And then you just, you know, yeah, you're going through your photos, you call them and you make your, the selections you want very easy. You, you go down with the, with the arrows and then you hit space bar. That's select. You just go boom, 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 boom. You hit all the ones you want, right? This is before color grading It's before editing. Okay. Now you've got all your selections ready to go. You've got your cold images. Now it's time to start editing. Now, if you come across an image that needs retouching before you color edit, here's what you do. And this is absolutely groundbreaking is you right click on that image and you click edit with Photoshop. It opens Photoshop for you. There's the image in full res TIFF format with the same color profile, all, all color managed and everything ready for you to do your retouching. You retouch in Photoshop, you, you flatten the image in Photoshop, you hit command S, you save it. And then, and then literally you can just, you can, you can delete the image, you can close the image and then you just go back to capture one and right in front of you, right above your raw file and your raw image is a TIFF version of that with all your Photoshop edits. And then, and then there you go. You're ready to just start editing and then finalize it. And, and that's it. You don't have to have a separate workflow for Photoshop. You just bounce from, from capture one to Photoshop, capture one to Photoshop, capture one to Photoshop. Everything's full res. There's very minimal compression. It is absolutely Amazing. And so combining that with a tethered capture one is, is probably the biggest thing that's changed my workflow. That's awesome. Coming up, I'm going to talk about things that have changed my photography life. You are listening to the F11 photography podcast. All right, we are back and I'm going to talk about uh, something that I hold near and dear to my heart that has changed my photography world. And that is contract apps. So there's so many photographers out there 
And I've actually seen this happen. And, and I've actually developed a reputation in this town for being a stickler for dotting my I's and crossing my T's when it comes to contracts. And I've had very respectable photographers in this town, like send me private messages on Instagram and say, Hey man, I have this issue I have with this shoot that I did a while back. What, what, what are my, what's my legal recourse? Like I'm not a fucking lawyer, but I am a stickler for dotting my I's, crossing my T's and having stated uh, goals in writing for every single shoot I do. And the models even like kind of roll their eyes. The only time I never have a model sign a release is when I take their digitals because I'm never, nobody's ever going to sell their digitals. They're like, they're, you know, even though I do charge for digitals, I, I, that's the one exception where I'm just like, don't, don't worry about signing it. I know you're just sending this off the modeling agencies because you're trying to get signed or whatever. You're just trying to get booked for a gig or whatever. So that's the only time I don't have model models sign uh, a contract, uh, a release, but there's, there's legal reason for it. You can't just take somebody's image and do whatever you want with it. Like you have to have them sign off to use their likeness. Like you can't, this is just, this is a big thing in Hollywood. This was the, the hang up of the writer's strike that happened was because one of the stipulations in there was that they were going to say that, Hey, if we ever have you appear in a movie, we're going to have artificial intelligence, take a snapshot of your, your facial structure. And then moving forward, we're going to be able to use your likeness from here on out as AI and you have no legal recourse. That was one of the big hangups of the writer's strike is like as an actor, if you're listening, it's like, fuck no, you can't use my likeness because it's an AI version of you. And that, that set a legal precedent. Well, when I take your picture or you take a model's picture or a subject picture, that's a real person. Okay. And that's a real likeness. That's not artificial intelligence. Okay. And so you have to have an app or some sort of a contract with an app in it, you know, to make your life easier. And so I use a, a an app called Easy Release, and I'm not plugging them in that they sponsor the pod. They don't. I paid for it. It's a quirky app. It's got some issues, but uh, what it does is it covers your ass. So what you know, basically, what it'll say is I can you know sell these pictures if I want to. Uh, I can use them for video. I can use them for whatever I want. And you're, you know, giving me, you're, you're granting this release and, and whatnot, but you can't even post somebody's pictures on Instagram or Facebook without a release. And, uh, if, if you are going to take things a step further and, you know, maybe the model is going to sell their pictures or whatever, well, then you need to have a different contract. Uh, easy release is what I use for creative collaborations. Uh, but point being is you need to have some sort of a legal app to save your ass because, Ultimately, what happens is if there's a dispute between you and the person you took the pictures of and you take it to a judge, the judge is always going to go, well, what does your contract say? And if there is no contract, as a photographer, you're fucked using their likeness. Now, you do own the copyrights to your images, but you can't do anything with those copyrights. They basically can sit in a hard drive. You can open them up and look at them and go, oh, cool, I took this picture of this person, but I can't do anything with it because I don't have some sort of a legal document supporting it. So... It doesn't, I'm, I'm not necessarily plugging easy release. I've just been using it forever, but go research, uh, contract apps for your phone. And the reason why that, that matters, the reason why I, I say get an app is because a, who wants to, who wants to carry a piece of paper around them, a contract that can, you know, get rained on and they have to carry a pen around just carry it on your phone. It also gives you a database of these models. So if you ever need to email them anything, you've got their email in the contract and, and you can get a hold of them that way. It'll have a, a section for their phone number. Uh, it does ask for their address. I never ask for a model's address because where they live is none of my business. And you know, if they end up, you know, getting murdered and turned into a, a lampshade or something like that, you don't have their address, right? <laughs> <laughs> in, in the, I, I, in just event, yeah, Kevin just turns to me and like is looking for my. I, I was looking at I was looking at Brandon to react to that one. I'm like so, yeah, I'm like yeah, you know, technically you're very correct in that. No, but I'm just saying like I don't want to know where somebody lives. Uh, but I do need to be able to get a hold of them. Now the reason why it matters, uh, you know, the reason why you want everything at the app is because I have the model fill out the app right in front of me, like just fill in the blanks and everything, and then they sign it, and then I immediately email it to both them and myself. So before we even leave the shoot, they have a copy of that. And there's also like really good language in there to protect the model that I've learned about over time. I like kind of actually read the contract. Like I can't use these, these shots in any sites that feature pornography, which is important because you can Photoshop anybody's head onto anything. And so it's, it's just, it's good peace of mind 
mind, it's good to state what each of you are doing uh, when you're doing a shoot, just like you would with a corporation. What are we doing with these images? How are we going to use these images? And, and that matters. Like, are you going to make a photo book? you know, a, a coffee table book and sell it with these images of the the model on there. That's important to know if, the, if, because the model may be like, holy shit, you're selling a coffee table book for a hundred dollars and three pictures in there of me. And I didn't get paid for this. You know, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're stating your intentions. But anyway, to the point of the episode, when we're talking about tech that has changed my life, uh, being able to be a legit person who has legal contracts in my phone at all times. And by the way, there's addendum sections. So for instance, uh, let's say, you know, let, let's say you're shooting, uh, maybe they do want to sell images or maybe you want to grant them usage through perpetuity. Cause Brandon shoots a lot for entrepreneurs and he's fine with them using his images in perpetuity. You can go into the addendum and go, uh, you know, all images are okay to be used in perpetuity on Instagram and other social media platforms. Or maybe you're shooting uh, fine art nudes. Well, it doesn't address nudity in there. So maybe you have a, an addendum that says model understands that they appear partially or fully nude in some or all photos. Cover your ass. That's my point. And uh, a tech that has changed my life and made my life a lot easier is uh, contract apps. So that's... Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because that's actually something I'm in the market for. I, I I never I have not perfected any sort of workflow around contract making. Uh, I I do currently, if anyone's interested in 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 uh, something that's not quite as great, um, but before they want to spend a subscription service for contracting specifically, Format does have a great uh, document and uh, template system where I have a number of templates for for contracts through the website of Format through the the host the photography host site of Format. I use Format as well. It's a great it's a great platform. They're Canadian. They're they're polite. Absolutely. Eh? And so yeah, what I'll do is I can send uh, these documents to clients in which they do have a client database uh, function where I can just take you know so and so's name, their Instagram, and their email, put them in the database, and then when I when I draft up this template and I just I just insert their name, it's a model release form. I send it to their email, they sign it. Cool, it's in Format's database for me, and I can just access it whenever. But getting over to what makes my life easier in in establishing that client and photographer relationship and establishing the mood and establishing the direction and the itinerary of the shoot, I use an app called Milanote. Um, this is an app that you can use for free. Um, it's something where it does have a lot of assets for free that you can use. I used it for free for the first six months because I wanted to try it out. And um, whenever I use it to create a mood board and an itinerary for people, what I, what I did was I just deleted it after the shoot and built a new one. Uh, I couldn't have multiple at the same time because that's that's where the that's where the subscription comes in. But in test driving it, it is amazing. So some of the features I do like about Milanote is it acts as a blank canvas where you can drag and drop photos, you can drag and drop your own mood boards, you can create mood boards and clickable links within the mood board itself. You can draw arrows and you can you can write text and basically think of think of it as a cork board for all your ideas and inspiration. You can build out the flow of the board. You can build out the flow of the shoot and what it looks like on the board itself. If you have a specific color palette or, or a mixture of colors you wanna go with, you can literally grab the palettes and put in your hex codes and boom, there it is, it's on display. I use it in tandem with a Huion writing tablet where I can just free flow thoughts and, and scribble and stuff like that. Speaking of tech, this changed your life. We'll get to that in a minute. Keep Ab going. Absolutely. Uh, it's funny. I actually didn't write that one down, but another one that Kevin brought to I the did. table. <laughs> Dude, Kevin, Kevin's been changing my life this last year. I tell you what. Yeah. So uh, to Brandon's mom, he's eventually going to marry me and we're going to now fucking with you. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. And so... And so, yes, I use Milanote for a lot of things. I use it. There's a little call sheet template. There's a, there's a column template where I put the times, dates. There's a task checkoff list where I can write down the equipment in case anyone needs to know what equipment I'm using. I, I have a little checklist for my own personal uses. It has a mood board function where you can just drag and drop photos and write notes and comments alluring to each photo, what you like about it, what you don't like about it. It is completely, it's a mind dump for your own purposes. And I've gotten a lot of great feedback from not only, not one, not two, but multiple model agencies saying they love the articulation of it. It saves them a headache. They, uh, everyone can be a part of this board. You can just send it to everyone and they know 
what's going on. You can send it to your, your makeup artist, your hairstylist, the model agency, the model, and even the studio, the creative director, and everyone knows what to expect out of the shoot. I use MailerNote for my call sheets uh, that I send to agencies. I really like it for that. Uh, for, for me, personally, for mood boards, um, uh, for my YouTube channel templates, uh, t- uh, thumbnails, whatever. Uh, and also, I use it for my rate sheet that I send to agencies. I use Canva uh, online. It's a browser based. It's just just like Milanote. It's browser based. Um, you know, like Milanote, there's a free version of it. Uh, you're limited as far as what you can do. I find that I can do a little bit more with the free version of Canva over Milanote. I will say overall that Milanote seems to be a little bit more advanced as far as what you can do, how you can link things up, and all that. But if your end goal is to make something no more complex than a PDF document. I find Canvas fine for that. But if you really want to get into the weeds, Milanote is definitely uh, a little bit more advanced and a little more complex. But either of those, Canva is great. I tend to use Canva for my mood boards. And one of the cool things about Canva is as I uh, drop my pictures in, it takes note of the primary colors in each picture. And so I have like three circles off to the side. And when I go to those circles, when you go to the eyedropper tool area for the colors, for the circles, it'll actually like show you the predominant colors in each picture. And you can drop those colors in as your your, your color theme uh, because you might notice a, a recurring theme there, especially if you're shooting in monochrome. That one's an easy one, black, gray, white. But you can put that in there and it'll kind of give, uh, you know, stylists and um, designers an idea of the colors you're going for. So definitely those are all great uh, when we get back, when we come back, we will talk about, uh, tablets. You are listening to the F11 photography podcast. All right. So we're back and yes, uh, Brandon had alluded to it. The one major piece of tech that has changed my life the most is a fucking tablet. And I don't know why it took me so long to ditch the mouse and use a tablet, but if you don't like carpal tunnel, I highly recommend you go out and get a tablet. Now, most people out there uh, will refer to, um, uh, what should I call it? They'll call them Wacom tablets. Wacom was kind of the leader in there. They're kind of the jacuzzi of tablets, you know, but there are jacuzzis just, uh, you know, people could refer to a tablet as a Wacom, but it may not actually be a Wacom. So I use Huion, which is, uh, I'm sure, I think, I don't remember if they're Korean or Chinese, but either way. They're, they're $30 on Amazon, so they're kind of throwaways, uh, you, you know, but they're built well. The stylus on the, uh, the stylus it comes with is great. The touch uh, responsiveness is great. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing in the world of photography, you don't have to go super expensive. I would imagine if you are a graphic designer or you are a drawer, a digital drawer, you know, you might want to go something more expensive like Wacom or something like that. But I find for photography editing, if it's good enough for me to do micro dodging and burning on skin, then it's good enough for me. That's, uh, and that's so, a really good point is I just want to interject and say that I was incredibly like taken aback by how effective something was for how affordable it was. I'm not used to spending 30 to 45 bucks on a piece of photography equipment and it changing my flow so quickly and being so good at what, like I've had no hiccups with it. I'm sure you've had a similar experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think, you know, I used to, I used to use a long time ago. I thought, what was the name of the, I don't even remember the name of the, uh, the app, but there was an app that I used to kind of help create some, uh, uh, filters and uh, frequency separation, which I don't believe in anymore. I don't like using fre- frequency separation at all for skin editing, but I used it. I think it was called Portraiture. I think it was the name of the program. Portraiture 2, Portraiture 3 is what I would use. And I still, from time to time, if somebody is paying me to do a quick job and I'm taking a picture of somebody from 10 feet away and I just want to like, usually I just take the blemishes out real quick with the spot heal tool. But if I just want to do a quick edit on somebody's face and I'm not getting paid much and they're a distance, they're far distance away and you can't really see details on their skin. I'll still use portraiture every now and then, but that's from a far distance away. When I'm up close, I do micro dodging and birding the hard way. I go through, I heal people's skin and you have to have a tool that can accommodate that. And a mouse is not that tool. And so, yeah, the Huion tablet uh, that I use and you know, you can, there's other brands out there too. So I'm not necessarily plugging Huey on. I just have had it for years and it's been amazing. And I actually bought a second one. Uh, I keep one 
permanently installed at my workstation. And then when I'm on the road, I have one in my backpack. So if I do a shoot for an agency, I'm in Dallas and I'm not in Austin, uh, I can quickly start doing some edits that night in my hotel room. And uh, yeah, I can start shooting, shooting them the edits really quickly. Yeah, dude, it's, it's, it's so funny because like, like you said, like I just keep, I keep it connected to my PC at all times. I like, I like a minimal setup. So I've got my, my keyboard, my mouse are both Bluetooth. Um, and then to my left, I've got the Huey on tablet and the pen just right there. So if I'm ever just quickly just moving to something where I need to write down notes or I need to do, uh, you know, quick writing on Milanote, or I just need to start, you know, do quick, uh, quick brush strokes or something on Photoshop, or I find some time to quickly edit some photos, or even if I'm editing just for fun, it is such an ease of access to just boom, pick up the pen. It's already plugged in and it works as a mouse in any case. Sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll literally forget to go back to my mouse and I'll just use the Huey on tablet just to like, just go to Google because it, it like, it's so, it's so easy. It just fits right in. It's not like a learning curve. There's no learning curve to it. The, it just, it just works. Um, it just works. hundred percent, hundred percent. Uh, this is going to be slightly more boring tech, but so critical tech. And that is your client resource management software or CRM software. Oh I personally use QuickBooks. I pay $30 a month for it. And honestly, uh, it has transformed my business. So there's so many of you out there who are photographers who have really basic questions about business because you're a creative who needs to learn how to do business. And there's nothing more annoying and stressful than when you're just trying to be an artist, having to balance your books, having to categorize purchases and do expense reports, having to calculate sales tax and pay it quarterly or yearly. Uh, so first and foremost, go get yourself a CPA. If a CPA charges you $400 a year, I guarantee you that's going to be very, very minimal compared to the amount of uh, penalties you'll incur with the IRS. As a matter of fact, I made a mistake when I uh, set up my company, I had it to where it was going to collect sales tax quarterly. And uh, I didn't know that. And I thought I was paying my sales tax at the end of the year. And the amount of penalties I incurred for not paying my sales tax quarterly ended up coming out to $1,600. That is fucking expensive with the state of Texas. And the great thing about having uh, software now, I did change that. Now I do it yearly. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll see how that all turns out. The state, uh, sometimes they'll say, no, you have to do it quarterly or whatever, but, uh, having software to manage you, like I will go into a camera store and I will pay for film and it has learned actions that, Oh, you used your card at this store and it categorizes it as a film purchase. There's places online that I purchase from uh, with my, my QuickBooks card, and it categorizes it as a film purchase or film development. Or if I go into Home Depot, it knows that I'm buying usually uh, you know, sources, uh, you know, business uh, materials for my studio or whatever. And so uh, having all that stuff in the same place is amazing. Uh, at the end of the year, uh, I know how much I owe the IRS. I know how much I owe the state of Texas and, and it makes my life a lot easier. I can forecast things and go, wow, how much, uh, you know, how much money have I made this quarter? And, uh, you know, just being able to see what I spend my money on is great. And the expenses section, it's like, wow, I spent way too much fucking money on film. Like I always do. And so, uh, being able to categorize that is amazing, but it's also great to have your phone bark at you and say, Hey, this invoice is overdue or, Hey, what do you want to do with this estimate? It's just kind of sitting here in no man's land. Is the client going to move forward with it? Additionally, uh, something that you can write off. I think it's like 55 cents a mile. Every time you drive to and from a shoot, like for instance, I make, we, you know, we're, we, we have sponsors for this pod driving to and from this podcast today, my phone tracks my mileage in, in, in QuickBooks and it says, Hey, you drove from here to here on such and such date. Was that a business related expense? And I can go, yeah, and I can write off 55 cents a mile just to record this pod to and from. And my phone, because I turn location services on on QuickBooks, every time I get my car and drive somewhere is tracking my mileage. And uh, I go in monthly and I go, okay, well, I, what I do is I go look at my calendar of everything that I did, because if I go to the grocery store, I'm not going to write that off. I'm an honest human being. But if I come down to my studio to shoot a model, even if it's a free shoot, like we are not exchanging money, that is still a business expense because uh, those creative uh, shoots, 
I use as my portfolio material and my portfolio material is marketing material to help sell paid jobs. And so I can run off the mileage that I did to, to go, you know, to that, to that shoot. Uh, if, you know, we have a, somebody who wants to talk to us about sponsoring the pod and we take them out for lunch. Now they should be taking us out for lunch, but if I take them to the batch place across the street and I pay for it with my card, that business expense of that lunch can be written off. And so QuickBooks tracks all of this. Now I'm not saying you have to use QuickBooks. You can use NetSuite. Uh, I think some people use something called Pixie set or something like that. There's, there's, you go figure out the CRM software that works for you. But the bottom line is that if you are serious about your photography business and you're not an accountant to yourself, you need to have some sort of a client resource CRM management software out there helping you with your books so you can focus more on creating. See, that's really helpful. Um, that's something I'd use. I'm not quite there yet. And uh, I, I'm... I'm t- <laughs> Getting, I'm, I'm totally rolling on my words here, but no, that that's incredibly useful for organizing how how you want your money to be spent and all that sort of stuff. I still use a lot of Google Sheets kind of things. Um, I also use Rocket Money to track my expenses, what's tax deductible and what's not, and under what umbrella I want all that to go. Um, of course, I have an LLC managing all my stuff, as a lot of a lot of what I do is contract based. Um, but I wanted to get into the last thing very, it's very quick because we've, we've definitely talked a lot about what we wanted to share with you guys because we're very passionate about the things that make our lives very easy. And we want you guys to benefit from it as well. The, the last thing that I find incredibly helpful, which might be something you've all taken for granted is focus peaking. Um, now a lot of us, uh, and a lot of cameras in this day and age have such a powerful autofocus that this isn't, you know, that big of an issue. It's, it's more important, more critical for people who'd be using their cameras on a tripod for video. But I will say, if you are someone like myself who likes to use film lenses on their cameras, who likes to go back in time and utilize 105s, like the 105 millimeter lens that St- uh, Stephen McCurry used to shoot the Afghan girl, say, I want to use that on my Nikon Z8. And I don't want to miss a shot because it's very easy to uh, get a shot out of focus when you're in a studio, a dark studio with a single key light and a film lens on your camera. Focus peaking will help me nail that shot every single time. Not only will it help me nail that shot, it'll help me nail that shot without having to sacrifice uh, depth of field. So if I feel like taking that shot at 1.8, at two, at 2.8. I can do that because my focus peaking will tell me where the focus is. Instead of just eliminating risk and going to F11 or F8 or F9 or whatever, I don't have to, I don't have to sacrifice the depth of field that I prefer to shoot at with focus peaking. So if you're someone who likes to use old lenses or is, is wanting to use their camera in videography, focus peaking is something uh, that I definitely look for in a camera. There is a caveat to focus peaking that I want to talk about. Um, as somebody who uses lenses that are meant for different formats, you can run into back focus and front focusing issues. If you're taking a medium format lens and you're putting it on a 35 millimeter body, or you're taking a 35 or medium format lens and putting it on an APS-C body. Cause I shoot Fuji X series. I shoot Fuji GFX and I shoot a uh, Canon full frame R5. And so sometimes I'll take a six by seven lens and I'll put it on a, uh, a Canon R5 or I'll take a six by seven lens and fuck, I'll even put that on a APS-C. And so even though focus peaking is telling you that you're in focus because you're taking a different format on there, sometimes it's not quite right and you might front or back focus. So do keep in mind the formats that you're using. Uh, the bonus tip on that is that if you're, your uh, camera has a zoom feature, uh, focus check. So, uh, I, I do this all the time when I'm using, uh, 35 millimeter lenses on my uh, GFX is the back command dial. If I push it in, it'll zoom in real quick and I can see like somebody's eye and I can see if it's like, uh, you know, focus peaking, but I can also double check the actual real focus on it and just make sure that it is in focus. But to Brandon's point, yes, focus peaking is awesome when I'm using a native lens that's correct. So like uh, I love my Fuji GFX and I've talked about it a million times on this, on this pod is that the autofocus in studio on my GFX fucking sucks. They apparently uh, addressed that with the new GFX uh, 102, but my GFX 100 S does not have the greatest autofocus. And I actually find that, Hey, I'm shooting an F8, F11 in the studio. Anyway, why don't I just throw it in manual focus when I know everything's in focus, the model's staying within a certain, uh, you know, 
area, they're not going to move out of out of the, the depth of field of F8 or F11. So I'll just leave it there and I'll take a bunch of shots. But if they start moving a little bit because I'm trying to create motion or whatnot, I'll double check my focus again. And so, you know, having that skill, it's just another thing as a photographer is if you do like to shoot on vintage lenses to get really beautiful, unique looks, uh, you can do that and focus peaking is your friend. That does it for today's episode. We talked about a lot of stuff today, a lot of cool tech. Hopefully some of this tech you'll take to heart and try it on your rig. Maybe it'll transform your life. And if it does, email us and tell us about it, okay? F11pod.com is where you can find us. Our handle on all major platforms, F11pod. And soon on YouTube, F11 pod. It exists. We don't have any episodes out, new episodes out, but it will be coming down the pipeline for video. And until next time, kids chase light and not algorithms. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For more information about this podcast, go to www.f11pod.com.